In the last few videos, we examined uh, some of the arguments against scientific realism. Uh, now, although I don't find any of those arguments convincing, I hope it's clear that realism does face some pretty serious challenges. So today, uh, we're going to maybe see if the realists can turn the tables a little bit, and we're going to look at some of the realist attacks on anti-realism. Now, recall that anti-realism, uh, or, or at least the form of anti-realism that we're mainly focusing on in this series, is the claim that we do not have knowledge of unobservable entities, uh, the unobservable parts of, of, uh, of th that are postulated by our theories. With science, we learn about the nature of observable phenomena, but we should suspend judgment about anything beyond that. Now, obviously, this view depends on a distinction between the observable and the unobservable. Uh, you know, prima facie, this distinction looks perfectly straightforward. Observable entities are those that can be detected by the unaided senses, like trees, cars, animals, voices, heat, and so on. Uh, unobservables are those that can only be detected with the use of instruments, bacteria, genes, cosmic rays, electrons, photons. But many, uh, and, uh, many realists have argued that anti-realists have placed too much weight on this distinction. There are, there are no significant differences between observables and unobservables. Um, of course, we can, uh, we can draw a distinction wherever we want. Um, it's, it's obviously true that some entities can be observed with the unaided senses and some entities can't. Uh, if that's how the observable-unobservable distinction is defined, um, you know, that is clearly a perfectly coherent, uh, coherent distinction. But the interesting question is whether this distinction has any epistemic relevance. If the realist can undermine the anti-realist's attempt to draw a strict line, or the realist can show that any such line will have no epistemological upshots, then the anti-realist faces a dilemma. We either You either reject knowledge of all entities and embrace a, a radical scepticism, or you accept that we can have knowledge of entities that aren't directly perceivable, which is, um, you're basically becoming a realist there. Uh, so in this video we're going to look at the suggestion that standard anti-realism is an untenable position. We can't treat so-called unobservables differently from observables. So let's try to define the distinction a bit more precisely. Uh, an outline has been provided by Baz van Frassen. I should note we'll be mentioning van Frassen quite a lot in this video. Uh, anti-realism is uh, not so popular in modern philosophy and van Frassen is the foremost anti-realist so a lot of discussion has come back to his work. Anyway, Van Fressen suggests uh, X is observable if there are circumstances which are such that if X is present to us under those circumstances, then we observe it. Um, I don't think this is really so helpful. Uh, I mean, after all, the realist would probably say, well, uh, just give me a microscope and it, un under the circumstances in which I have a microscope, I'll observe a Yersinia pestis bacterium. So I think the, the better definition is to say that an entity is observable just in case uh, if we are in the vicinity of the entity and we look in its direction, then we will not need any special instruments to see the entity. I mean, that's framed in terms of vision, but of course we could generalise it to all uh, sensory modalities. So, you know, if, if we have our hand on the entity, uh, then we won't need any special uh, instruments to feel the entity. Um, so the point here is that if you take something like the moons of Jupiter, uh, well, they could be seen if we were to hop onto a spaceship and fly to Jupiter. If we were if we were standing near those moons and we were to look at them, we would be able to see them. Um, you know, it, it, in the same way, a few people have directly observed without any instruments the craters on the moon by actually going to the moon. On the other hand, detecting a Yersinia pestis bacterium will always require instruments. Uh, and I think this is what Van Frassen is really getting at, at least based on his arguments. The observable is that which can be detected, the, the unobservable is that which, the observable is that which can be detected without instruments. The unobservable is that which requires instruments. Um, this is the kind of distinction that the anti-realist puts a lot of weight on. So what are some objections to this? Uh, distinction. Why is this supposed to be a problem? Well, a famous challenge is Grover Maxwell's argument from the continuum. Uh, I quote Maxwell here. He says, there is a continuous series beginning with looking through a vacuum and containing these as members. Looking through a window pane, looking through glasses, looking through binoculars, looking through a low power microscope, looking through a high power microscope, etc. Maxwell's point is that 
there are a variety of different ways that we can augment our perception. On the one hand, we have simple eyeglasses. On the other, we have electron microscopes. But there are a whole variety of things in between. So drawing a line at any particular place is just going to be arbitrary. I mean, Van Frassen would probably accept that what we see with uh, using eyeglasses counts as observable. Um, but then why wouldn't you know, using binoculars, why shouldn't that count as observable? And if using binoculars counts as observable, why not using a low-power microscope? And, and so on. And so Maxwell is saying it's, it's just arbitrary trying to draw a line. Another way that we can see this arbitrariness is to note that technological change uh, sometimes allows the unobservable to become observable. So Copernican astronomy, which uh, places the sun at the centre of the solar system, was in many respects an improvement over the older geocentric system, which has the Earth at the centre. Uh, but due to the theological implications of Copernican astronomy, it was originally treated by many astronomers as merely an instrumentally useful system. Uh, Anti-realism about astronomy was very popular in the 15 and 1600s. The thought was that well, you know, we, we can learn about the apparent motions of the planets, but the real motions, you know, what's really going on, that's hidden to us. The most we can ever hope to do is describe the observable behaviour. Now, in a very significant sense, the planets uh, and their moons were unobservable. In Galileo's time, there was no prospect at all of visiting the planets. Uh, all, we, all, all we could do is generate increasingly detailed images of them in telescopes. Actually, going to Jupiter was a fantasy for him, just as the notion of being shrunken down to microscopic size and directly interacting with bacteria is a fantasy for us. Of course, it, it was possible to see planets with the naked eye. Um, you, know, you can still see planets with the naked eye, but they're nothing but specks of light. Uh, you can't see Saturn's rings or Jupiter's great red spot with the naked eye. So these features would have been straightforwardly unobservable uh, in, in the 1600s. A few centuries later, it turns out we actually can visit the planets um, and we now consider them observables. Um, I mean, obviously, we haven't, we haven't sent any humans to Jupiter, but in principle, we could do. Uh, it, it, would, it would cost a, a lot of money, but there's, in principle, we could, we could easily do it. And we have sent humans to the moon. Um, and I mean, the, you know, the, the claims that the planets orbit the sun, that Saturn has a large ring system, that, that, that Jupiter has this enormous uh, red spot, this storm that's been raging for centuries, these are obviously literally true. Um, at least that's, even anti-realists would accept that these are literally true. But the anti-realists would have drawn, and in fact anti-realists did draw, the wrong conclusion uh, at, at the time, in, in the 1600s, because of their criterion of observability. I mean, it, it may be worth noting in, in this connection with the example of telescopes, that telescopes operate in essentially the same manner as light microscopes. Uh, telescopes and light microscopes both use lenses to magnify the light. Um, they, they, they sort of operate, the, the mechanics are very similar. Um, now, we know that telescopes uh, uh, represented the previously unobservable world correctly. We now know that, that what telescopes show is correct. Um, perhaps that should give us some confidence that what microscopes show us is correct. Um, but the, the, the point that I'm making here is just that the, the change of technology has allowed the unobservable to become observable. Um, could this happen in the future? Well, I think it plausibly could. Um, so an example uh, discussed by William Krieger and Brian Keeley, uh, suppose that a man hears a series of tones of an increasingly high pitch. Each time the tone sounds, his dog barks. Eventually, as the tones become uh, really high pitched, the man becomes unable to hear any further tones. However, the dog continues to bark periodically. We usually suppose that there are continuing tones that the dog but not the human can hear. Now, we can imagine future technology allowing us to adapt the human ear so that it becomes capable of detecting higher tones. And we already have things like cochlear implants that can improve hearing. So, I mean, in principle, there's no, you know, we, we could, it seems, with greater technology, actually augment the hearing of all humans. Future technology could extend the range of human hearing. Uh, and then, presumably, uh, these these higher tones that at the moment are unobservable would become observables. So there just doesn't seem to be any 
uh, force to this distinction between things that are observable to us and things that aren't because the line is so easily altered and uh, any line that we, that we do draw is going to be arbitrary. Uh, so um, now Van Frassen uh, has, I think, quite a plausible response to this. Uh, Van Frassen says that all Maxwell has really done here is demonstrate that the boundary between the observable and the unobservable is somewhat vague. The problem of vagueness is a very general philosophical problem uh, that affects pretty much everything and that philosophers have pondered about for thousands of years. Um, so in the same way, we could put a load of men in a line, starting with a man who is clearly bald and ending with a man who is clearly not bald. Uh, we wouldn't conclude that there are therefore no bald people. Um, I mean, for, for an example that has more philosophical import, consider consciousness. Very arguably, consciousness is not an on-off switch. There are various different states and degrees of consciousness. On the one end, we have an alert, uh, normal human uh, adult. On the other hand, we have uh, a very simple measuring instrument like a thermometer. Now, in between, there are uh, bacteria, insects, computers, robots, fish, uh, octopus, dogs, apes. There are trances, dream states, states induced by drugs and so on. Uh, and so consciousness appears to be vague as well. It's not clear where we, we, it's not clear that we can draw a strict line. But nevertheless, there's clearly a distinction between conscious and non-conscious beings. It's clearly an important distinction, a philosophically relevant distinction. So Van Frassen thinks that uh, Maxwell's appeal to the continuum is, uh, he's really just applying this problem of vagueness, which is actually a general philosophical problem, and, and so we can't use this to attack uh, the anti-realist in, in, in particular. All the anti-realist needs to do, according to Van Frassen, is provide clear examples of observable objects and clear examples of unobservable objects. If there's a bit of a grey area, well, that's to be expected because there are grey areas in every topic. And it's, it seems it's easy to generate clear cases. So uh, for observables, we have uh, trees, cars, planets, oceans, the moons of Jupiter, mountains, spiders, hands and feet. For unobservables, we have electrons, neutrinos, dark matter, Yersinia pestis, mitochondria, genes, and the strong nuclear force. Um, there may well be cases in between, but you know, so be it. That what we have a clear set of observables and unobservables, and that's good enough. So um, now one, uh, I think the main challenge to this claim uh, is uh, to deny that there are such clear cases of unobservables, um, or at least there are far fewer clear cases than Van Frassen would really need. Dudley Shapir discusses this in his article, The Concept of Observation in Science and Philosophy. Uh, so here are a couple of quotes that Shapir opens his article with. Uh, first from uh, Weeks's book, High Energy Astrophysics, Weeks says, uh, I quote, neutrinos originate in the very hot stellar core in a volume less than a millionth of the total solar volume. This core region is so well shielded by, shielded by the surrounding layers that neutrinos present the only way of directly observing it. Uh, second, Clayton in the book Principles of Stellar Evolution and Nucleosynthesis says, there is no way known other than by neutrinos to see into a stellar interior. So it seems that many astrophysicists actually treat neutrinos as observable. Indeed, they even treat the centre of the sun as observable by means of detecting neutrinos. So let's look at this example in a bit more detail. Uh, the most obvious way that we receive information from the sun is in the form of electromagnetic radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, infrared, and, and so on, which is carried by photons. Uh, electromagnetic radiation is produced in the hydrogen fusion reactions in the sun's core. Now, hydrogen fusion involves a sequence of steps called the proton-proton chain. Here's a diagram of the first step in that chain. Uh, so here we have uh, two protons. Um, these protons collide and form a nucleus consisting of one proton and one neutron. So one of the protons is converted into a neutron. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons have no charge. So uh, one of these particles loses its charge. This lost positive charge is carried off by a positron, uh, here signified by E+, plus, 
uh, it's carried off by a positron, which is basically an antimatter electron, uh, which is positively charged. Uh, this step also produces a neutrino, um, uh, represented by this blue wiggly line. Um, this is because of the uh, for something known as the law of conservation of lepton number. Uh, leptons are a certain type of elementary particle, and in any reaction, the number of leptons before and after the reaction must be the same. The uh, positron is a lepton with the number minus one, minus because it's antimatter. So the lepton number to begin with is zero, since we have two protons, and, uh, and then it's m minus one uh, with the positron. The neutrino is a lepton with the number plus one. So uh, the, the, with the positron and the neutrino, the total lepton number is zero, which is uh, the same as it was before uh, the, the reaction. So uh, that is the first step of hydrogen fusion. Uh, now the uh, positron here is a form of antimatter, uh, it's an anti-electron. When the positron meets an ordinary electron, they annihilate each other. So this is an ordinary electron, this E minus. They meet, they annihilate each other, and they are converted into gamma ray photons. Photons, as I said, that's electromagnetic radiation. Um, now there are other steps in the proton-proton chain um, that, that also produce photons, um, but let's, I'll, I'll just focus on this one step. Uh, now we might think, uh, well, because hydrogen fusion produces photons and we can detect photons, then we can use the photons from the sun to learn about the conditions in its core. But the core is extremely dense and photons interact with atoms and electrons. A gamma ray photon produced by hydrogen fusion will be absorbed and re-emitted and scattered many billions of times before it reaches the surface. In fact, it takes an average photon about 100,000 years to uh, travel from the core to the surface, um, by which time the original character of the radiation has been uh, completely altered. For this reason, scientists think that we get direct information only from the surface of the sun. We can devise models of the interior, and these will match observations of the surface more or less well, but we don't get any direct information from the interior, because the photons are, are radically altered. Uh, be before they leave the sun. Or at any rate, we don't get uh, direct information from photons. But as, as we saw, the proton-proton chain also produces neutrinos. What's interesting about neutrinos is that they very rarely interact uh, with, with matter. There are billions of neutrinos passing through your body right now. Uh, the average neutrino could pass through a piece of lead a light year thick without interacting with it. The vast majority of neutrinos stream out of the core of the sun and stream through the earth completely unimpeded. However, very occasionally they will interact and this opens up the possibility of detecting them. The first neutrino detector was built in the 1960s. It consisted of a tank of about 100,000 gallons of uh, perchloroethylene, uh, which is a cleaning fluid. Um, the molecules of this consist of uh, two carbon atoms and four chlorine atoms. So, now this tank was buried deep underground. Um, this screens off other particles, but as I said, neutrinos can pass through the Earth with, e with ease. So neutrinos can, can easily go uh, very deep underground. Uh, uh, now, of course, the vast majority of neutrinos will also pass through the tank with ease, but very occasionally a neutrino will strike one of the chlorine atoms and this will convert one of the neutrons into a proton. Uh, this changes the chlorine atom into a radioactive isotope of argon. Uh, we can separate the argon from the chlorine by bubbling helium through the tank. Uh, now, counting the amount of radioactive argon allows us to determine the number of neutrinos coming from the sun. So, as Shapir notes, many scientists think that this method allows us uh, to literally observe the core of the sun. See, there's a crucial difference between electromagnetic radiation and neutrinos, uh, a difference that defines the boundaries of the observable, in Shapir's view. Information from the core of the sun is carried by neutrinos to detectors on Earth without interference. Photons from the core of the sun are radically altered. So Shapir suggests the following kind of analysis. X is observable, just in case, uh, number one, information is received by an appropriate receptor. 
and uh, information from X is received by an appropriate receptor. And two, uh, this information is transmitted directly, i.e. without interference, without interference to the receptor from the entity X. And if this analysis is accepted, then it looks like the anti-realist is in trouble. Remember, Van Frassen suggests that we can give clear cases of observables and clear cases of unobservables. And he thinks that the vast majority of entities that require instruments to detect will fall unambiguously on the unobservable side. Shapir uh, thinks that this is just contrary to how observation works in science. Actually, many of uh, Van Frassen's so-called unobservables are perfectly observable. Of course, you know, we, we might just say, well, uh, this is all just semantics. Why does it really matter how we you know, define the term observation? But there's an important point here. When we analyse how scientific observations actually work, we can draw a principled distinction between the observable and the unobservable, and this distinction has epistemological upshots. So given our theories of particle physics of the proton-proton chain and plausible assumptions about the interior of the sun, there's clearly a sense in which electromagnetic radiation uh, gives us direct information only about the surface uh, and, and theories of the interior have to be based on speculative inference if we're just going by electromagnetic radiation whereas neutrinos provide us with direct information about the core so why shouldn't that count as uh, observing the core or observing uh, neutrinos I mean uh, I think a relevant thing that we might want to bear in mind here is how uh, how do we gather evidence for observables? Uh, I mean, so to detect unobservables, science uses various kinds of measuring equipment. And the question is, why shouldn't we suppose that, m that, that measuring equipment for unobservables is in relevant respects equivalent to the human perception of observables? In other words, human perception is simply one kind of measuring equipment. Humans come naturally equipped with uh, various instruments for detecting properties in the world. Um, indeed, you know, the development of science suggests that humans aren't even especially good measuring instruments. Colour perception, for instance, responds to wavelengths of light, but in a very coarse way. And many philosophers have argued that colour is basically an illusion. Uh, I have a video on colour science where I talk about how the eye responds to colour. So uh, check that out if you're interested. Or consider the perception of temperature and heat. Our perceptions present a single spectrum from hot to cold, but this actually conflates uh, various properties, the amount of heat, the degree of heat, rate of exchange from, uh, of heat from one body to another. Uh, consider how easily perceptions can be manipulated. For instance, if you put your ha left hand on a radiator for a minute or so, and then you dunk both hands in water of average temperature, the water will feel cold to the left hand, but average to the right hand. Um, of course, the, the anti-realist might simply deny the scientific accounts postulated in these cases, but th there doesn't really seem to be any reason uh, to, to assume that humans are privileged detectors. Um, scientists will often use instruments to correct for errors in, in human perception. You know, why think that we are privileged? And if we're not privileged, then um, you know, what, what's wrong with saying that a neutrino detector allows us to detect information about the core, the core of the sun? Um, so anyway, you know, th there's a big debate about the notion of, of observation and how that's used in, in science, but um, I think we'll move on. Okay, so another argument along similar lines uh, as, as the last one, I guess, is what we might call the evolutionary argument. Uh, and this is the point that our capacities are products of evolution. They developed gradually, and in a certain respect, they are accidental. We could have had very different capacities. Indeed, our best science suggests that the world appears differently to different species. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, dogs apparently detect higher pitched sounds than we do. But various animals have the capacity for finer colour discrimination. Humans are um, trichromats. We have three types of cones in our retinas that are involved in colour vision. But many birds are tetrachromats. They have four types of cones. Uh, they have a, a cone that responds to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, so they can see colours that we can't even imagine. Some animals have sensory capacities that are completely foreign to us. Human homin, homing pigeons apparently have magnetoreception. They can detect the Earth's magnetic field and they use that for navigation. So with, that, with these kind of points in mind, we might well feel that anti-realism is 
it just sort of intolerably anthropocentric. It requires us to suppose that there is something privileged about what we happen to be able to observe directly. Uh, but there's, there's nothing special about humans. We evolved just like every other creature. So, uh, you know, this is perhaps a problem. Now, one response to this might be to suggest that we could extend the notion of observability to cover all species so that uh, the ultraviolet spectrum and the magnetic field do count as observables. I think the main problem here, though, is that uh, given evolution, um, the, f the fact is that sensory capacities are open to indefinite change. And that means that the category of the observable becomes totally open ended. I think perhaps a better response is to say that this argument uh, kind of begs the question in favour of realism. So pretty clearly the argument assumes that, for instance, the Earth has a magnetic field for homing pigeons to detect. But precisely this assumption is, is what the anti-realist wants to resist. Uh, the homing pigeons are displaying a certain kind of behaviour, and perhaps our best explanation for this behaviour is that they're detecting a magnetic field, but we can't conclude that this explanation is true. Um, Still, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, the realist might point out, well, look, I'm simply giving the standard scientific explanation for the behaviour of the homing pigeon. Uh, there's no there's no sort of philosophy here. As a matter of just established science, homing pigeons detect magnetic fields. If the anti-realist has a different explanation, the onus is on her to provide it. In lieu of that, it's reasonable for the realist to appeal to explanations offered by science. After all, anti-realists are not anti-science. Both the realist and the anti-realist will use science and use the results of science, so to that extent it's legitimate for the realist to appeal to scientific results. Um, perhaps a, a second response, which, which I think is a bit more plausible, uh, is to alter the thrust of the evolutionary argument slightly. The point is not that homing pigeons can detect magnetic fields. The point is that the behaviour of non-human animals gives us a very powerful reason to think. Uh, first of all, that there is an, 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 an unobservable structure to the world. There is structure to the world beyond what we can observe. And secondly, um, it gives us, the behaviour of non-human animals gives us reason to think that features of this unobservable structure are reliably detectable. Or, or at least that many features of the unobservable can be detected at least as well as we can detect features of the observable. Uh, non-human animals detect things that are beyond our perceptual abilities and we have no reason to suppose that uh, that human perception is is better than theirs that non-human animals get it wrong while we while we get it right so the challenge is well we know that there is a structure beyond the observable and we know that it can uh, be reliably detected because non-human animals reliably detect it so why should we suppose that when we detect it we go radically wrong Right, let's look at some other arguments. An interesting argument from Ian Hacking is uh, his coincidence argument, which essentially claims that we can have confidence in various unobservables because they are detected by independent processes. Hacking uses the example of viewing blood through uh, viewing blood samples through different types of microscope. If you look at red blood platelets through an electron microscope, you will see uh, these little black spots uh, on them that are called dense bodies. Uh, now we believe that these dense bodies are real because the same thing can be seen when we view the blood samples through a fluorescence microscope. Electron uh, microscopy and fluorescence microscopy involve completely different physical processes. Um, so it would just be a, a, a remarkable coincidence if, um, you know, it, 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 if the dense bodies didn't exist, if they were just uh, you know, if, if they were just products of, of the way the microscopes worked or, or whatever, it would be a remarkable coincidence that we see them through many different microscopes. And note, of course, that, that this occurs with uh, many uh, instruments and with many specimens. Uh, we, we often see the same structures. So in response to this, uh, Van Frassen points out that in creating and calibrating microscopes, we deliberately filter out any differences. We deliberately make microscopes so that they deliver similar results. Uh, we might use the first microscope to calibrate the second. In other words, we, we adjust the second until what it shows matches the first. 
but this means that the two microscopes are not really independent processes, hence there is no coincidence. I mean, sure, the processes are different, but one process has been specifically adjusted to match the other. Independence is what's important, and if one microscope has been adjusted in light of another, they're not independent. Hence, it's no surprise that we get the same results. Uh, consider also, uh, just for example, a, a cathode ray tube and a liquid crystal display television, different kinds of television display. Well, they may display the same images, or at least substantially similar images, but we would not conclude that, 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 that therefore there must be something real behind the screens. Um, you, know, it, you know, just because, well, they involve completely different processes, but they display the same images. Uh, we obviously wouldn't think that you know, a television contains uh, what the television represents is literally happening inside the television or, or something like that. Um, so, you know, uh, that seems to be a bit of a problem for, for hacking. I mean, in general, it's, it's no surprise that we would see similar things through different microscopes because we have the same input each time. In each microscope, we're looking at a blood sample. We can say uh, that we can assume that similar input will correlate to similar output without saying that uh, the output is an accurate representation of the input. So, I mean, by analogy, consider a, uh, a transform where we invert the colors of an image. This is a very simple transformation, and there are many different physical processes by which it can be performed. One way to do it is to open the image in MS Paint and invert the colors. Uh, another way is to draw the image by hand and then paint on inverted colours. Clearly, uh, these are very different processes, but a similar input to these very different processes will produce a similar output. In each case, a blue input will produce a yellow output. But the output is not a faithful representation of the original colour. It's, it's, inver it's inverting the original colour. So, uh, another argument from Ian Hacking is the grid argument. When making observations under a microscope, scientists will often place samples on very small grids. We know how to make a grid. Uh, you take a piece of, piece of metal, engrave some lines on it so you have a load of squares, and then add some letters in each square. Now, we make smaller and smaller versions until eventually we, re we reach extremely small microscopic sizes. Now, if we look at the grid through any kind of microscope with the appropriate resolution, we will see uh, the same lines and letters as on the large versions. So when we look at the Yersinia pestis bacterium, we know that this is veridical because we also see the grid that we made with the letters written on it. The grid tells us that the microscope is displaying the world as it really is. So uh, one response to this is to ask, well, how exactly do we know that the process of manufacturing the grid is reliable? How, how do we know that we, we actually made the grid as we intended it? I mean, clearly, Hacking's argument depends on the assumption that this microscopic grid is as we expected or intended it to be. But what's the justification for that? I mean, it's clearly no good to say, well, we know the manufacturing worked as we expected because we can check the results through a microscope, that would be circular. We'd be arguing that microscopes are reliable because they show an object as we made it to be. And we know that we successfully made the object because microscopes display it as we intended it to be. Uh, what, what, what we know is that we have the right image on the microscope. But perhaps this is achieved by uh, deviances in both the microscope and the grid. So by analogy, uh, one way to make an image of a curved line is to draw a curved line and then view it through a standard lens. Uh, another way to make an image of a curved line is to draw a straight line and then view it through a fish eye lens. In that case, both the uh, sort of original drawing uh, and the lens are, as it were, uh, deviant. Um, we, 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 see a straight, uh, we see a curved line but this is produced from a straight line with a distorting lens. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how con convincing this response is. Um, I mean, certainly it's, it's possible that both the microscope and the grid are deviant, but what are the chances? I mean, we, we sort of have to suppose that both the manufacturing of the grid and the microscope uh, could go wrong 
in just the right way that it gives us exactly the right observations and and that this happens with many items and many different microscopes. I mean, it's not just grids. You can make any number of microscopic items, and when you look at them under a microscope, they will look as you intended them to be. Uh, it seems rather unlikely that that would be a happy accident. Uh, a second point raised by Richard Schlegel is that we apply... Uh, these microscopic parts in all sorts of areas of technology. The fact that this technology works is a good sign that the manufacturing has gone correctly. Um, it, you, know, you know, so the, uh, we might make a very small microchip and look at it under a microscope and say, yes, that looks right. Uh, a good sign that the manufacturing is correct uh, and therefore that the micro microchip is as we intended it to be is that when we put it in a computer, it, um, it works properly. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of anti-realist would seem to be in a position where they have to maintain that, okay, the microscope does not provide an accurate representation of the microscopic world, uh, and the microchip is completely different from how we intended it to be. Yet somehow the microscope shows the microchip exactly as we intended it, and somehow the microchip works in uh, all of the computers that we put it in. I mean, this it does seem to strain credulity just a little bit. So uh, a final argument from Anthony Quinton, which is, I think, very similar to the previous arguments, but um, maybe subtly different. Uh, Quinton appeals to the importance of overlap. Now, Quinton says that we can be confident that the images in microscopes are veridical because, uh, and I quote, as the magnification increases, some of the detail that was observed at the previous stage is still there to be seen. So. The point is that features that are observable without any uh, augmenting, without any aid, can also be observed under a magnifying glass or a microscope. Uh, if you put an ant under a very low power light microscope, well, you, know, you, you, will, you will see the legs, the head, uh, and, and so on. You'll see these parts that you can see with, uh, with the naked eye. And if you say, if, for example, you shake the ant around under the microscope, you will see the shaking. Um, and the fact that that is accurate would suggest that the new things we see, the things, the features that we see that are usually unobservable, uh, they're probably also accurate. So what is seen at the highest level of magnification of a certain instrument uh, is also seen in the lowest level of magnification of another. Uh, so you know we can uh, we we calibrate uh, the the light microscope to what we see in vision. We check that the features shown by the light microscope match the features shown by vision, and so we can be confident that the features shown uh, only by the light microscope are also veridical. Then we can uh, compare the electron microscope to the light microscope. We can check that the features shown in the electron microscope match the features shown in the light microscope. Uh, here is a. Um, scanning electron micrograph of an ant. Uh, it reveals many features that cannot be seen with the naked eye, uh, like these little bumps on the eye of the ant, these hairs. Uh, so those features cannot be seen with the naked eye, but also quite clearly it, ca it captures the observable structure of the ant. Uh, we, can, we can see this overall structure, you know, the head and, and these uh, sort of body parts. We can see that with the naked eye. And it seems rather extraordinary to suppose that the microscope could get the overall structure right, and yet these bumps on the eyes or these hairs aren't really there. Uh, now, um, furthermore, so let's say we zoom in a bit further. Let's take this eye. Uh, this is a compound eye. Uh, these little bumps are all basically separate eyes. These are hexagon shapes. You probably can't see it so well on this image, but um, you know, if you look up photos of, of ant eyes, you'll see that they're composed of these very small hexagons. Now we can zoom in a little bit further uh, to, the, to, the, to the eye. We're zooming in very closely to the eye here. And notice that the hexagon shapes of the previous image are preserved. Uh, but of course, m much more detail is, is also shown. So this is a it's just this is an example of how uh, you know, the features that are shown at uh, one level of magnification are preserved at a higher level of magnification.
A similar point here that might be worth noting is the correspondence between observables and non-observables. Features that are revealed, uh, for instance, by radar or infrared imaging can later be observed directly by touch or closer inspection. Saturn's moon Titan is covered by a very thick atmosphere, about 10 times the depth of Earth's atmosphere, consists mostly of uh, nitrogen with some methane. In visible light, you can't see through the haze, so it appears, appears as a featureless ball. But we can view the planet in infrared light, and that allows us to see many of the features. Now we can land probes on Titan, and these probes have shown that the observable features of the surface correspond to what was revealed by the infrared. Similarly, consider how X-rays reveal bones that can be observed by opening up the body. Um, William Seeger also gives a good example of how uh, the infrared imaging of a field of potato plants can show diseased patches of plants that would be un indistinguishable under visible light. But obviously by uh, inspecting the plants carefully, we can, uh, we can determine that th those, those plants that appeared diseased under the infrared light are indeed a diseased. So um, those were some uh, objections to the anti-realists uh, observable unobservable distinction. A final thing I'd like to talk about in this video are uh, the different ways that scientific observations are produced. Um, we mentioned we've mentioned microscopes quite a bit in this video. Uh, so recall the quote from Grover Maxwell. Uh, he described building a continuous series of you know, looking through a window pane, looking through glasses, looking through binoculars, looking through a low power microscope, looking through a high power microscope. Uh, sort of, he tries to take us on a slippery slope. But what Maxwell's quote obscures is that there are very significant differences between different kinds of microscopes. Uh, arguably, he's, he's trying to take us down a slippery slope that's not so slippery. The traditional microscope, what we would usually think of as a microscope, is a light, is, is a light microscope. Uh, light microscopes deal with uh, visible light and they use a system of lenses to magnify the object. Uh, I mean, the simplest microscope is just a single lens or a magnifying glass. Now, how does that work? Well, you know, you, you take a lens and the lens refracts the light in such a way that it bends light rays inward and uh, so sort of uh, seems to uh, make the, the image bigger provides a bigger image of, of the object. Um, light microscopes use more lenses, but the principle is basically the same. So we can see a bacterium by using lenses to magnify visual light. What's important to note about this is that the human eye works in essentially the same kind of way. Uh, every object scatters light in a wide range of directions. A light wave from a particular region of uh, an object will overlap with light waves from other regions. So if you were to sort of take the light waves uh, as is, you'd end up with a big blur. Our eye provides a clear image by using a lens to sort of reverse that scattering process. It refracts the rays inward uh, on, onto a, a single point. So the use of lenses and visual light in light microscopes is similar to uh, the, the mechanics of the eye. Uh, now, light microscopes have limits. Uh, light uh, exhibits diffraction as a result of its wave character, and due to diffraction, there is a fundamental maximum to the resolution of any light microscope, known as the ab diffraction limit. Our best light microscopes are limited to resolutions of hundreds of nanometers, uh, and that's just because of the, the nature of visible light. But we can overcome this with, uh, with different microscopy techniques. A very different kind of technique is atomic force microscopy. I'm going to simplify this a little bit, but I want to give you a basic idea of how atomic force microscopy works. Here's a diagram. Um, so this uh, sort of reddish thing here is the sample. This is the thing that we want to image. For the microscope itself, we have uh, the cantilever, uh, uh, and the cantilever is basically a long rod with a very sharp tip at the end. Uh, the point of the tip consists of just a few atoms, so this is super small. Now, the cantilever uh, is moved across the sample, and as it moves across, it will move up and down depending on the topography of the sample. It's just like if you were to move a pen over an uneven surface, the pen would move up and down with the surface. So then we have a, uh, a laser beam, which is pointed at the top of the cantilever, and this uh, laser beam reflects from the top of the cantilever into a detector. 
as the cantilever moves up and down, uh, this deflects the laser beam, and by tracking how the, the laser is deflected, a computer can build up an image of the topography of the sample. Obviously, this is nothing like vision, uh, but it's also not really all that much like touch. The cantilever never touches the surface. Uh, instead, the uh, repulsive intermolecular forces push the tip away. Uh, there are many forces at work uh, between molecules, electrostatic forces, van der Waals forces, magnetic forces, for instance, caused by um, you know, magnetic dipoles on the tip and the surface. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of forces between molecules. These forces and how they interact with the cantilever will differ depending on the sample. So any inferences about the measurements are based on, on chemical theory concerning the intermolecular forces and, and how they will affect the cantilever tip. Um, so the point is that, that this, is, this is nothing like uh, any of our sensors. When we see an image created by an atomic force microscope, it certainly isn't like uh, viewing something with the eyes. It's completely different from, uh, from a light microscope. Of course, this doesn't show that atomic force microscopy is not veridical. Um, after all, uh, telephones and hearing aids also will make significant transformations of the original source, but uh, these both represent the world accurately. The point here is just that, contrary to uh, Maxwell, there, there is arguably a difference in kind, not just a difference in degree, between a low-power microscope and a high-power microscope. Broadly speaking, the light microscope uses the same mechanisms as the eye. The atomic force microscope is uh, seemingly different from any kind of human sensory modality. So perhaps this is where the anti-realist might draw a line. Uh, Sarah Vollmer, in her article, Two Kinds of Observation, has suggested that the line between observables and unobservables should be drawn based on our knowledge of physical processes. Um, and of course, one thing to bear in mind is that this would provide a much more uh, limited form of anti-realism. Indeed, perhaps this could perhaps be something of a compromise between uh, realism and anti-realism. Another uh, line might be between observation and detection. Uh, so, in some sense, the atomic force microscope seems to be observing the sample. Perhaps we could we we could argue that there is some sort of observation going on there. But in many cases. Um, there, there, there doesn't seem to be uh, observation in, in such a, a way. Uh, we would, might be better to speak instead of detection. So think, of, think about cloud chambers. A cloud chamber is basically a transparent box containing a um, supersaturated vapour of water or alcohol. When charged particles, say an alpha particle, go through the cloud chamber, they ionise the fluid in their path, which is to say they uh, strip the molecules of their electrons. Um, and the vapour then condenses around these trails of ionised molecules. This is because ions are electrically charged, so they attract a few molecules and then the uh, clumps of molecules attract even more molecules, and eventually we have a visible trail in the chamber. Now what's important to note about this is that what we actually observe here are the effects of the charge that the charged particle has on the vapour in the cloud chamber. We don't see the particle itself. I mean, in the same way, we might see the trail from a jet plane, but the plane itself is outside our visible range. Or consider the, uh, the example of neutrinos um, that we discussed earlier. We detect neutrinos by the effects they have on the chlorine when they convert a chlorine atom into a radioactive argon atom. So we might try to draw some sort of line uh, between, between observation. Perhaps, perhaps observation involves actually interacting with the entity, as an atomic force microscope arguably does. Uh, and mere detection, where detection involves kind of inferring that the entity is there because of its effects on other things. Um, so these are all, all things that might be worth uh, thinking about if you're interested, but uh, I think that's enough for today. Uh, so thanks for watching. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.